Hello everyone, welcome to Brainwaves. Uh, today we're going to talk about some uh, treatments for psychiatric disease which uh, are alternative to um, uh, mainstream biomedical treatments. Uh, as many of you know, uh, mainstream biomedical treatments for, for mental, major mental illness, uh, they help many people and they are indeed the first line of treatment uh, for, for most people, but uh, unfortunately they don't help everyone and they're far from perfect remedies. Uh, of the major psychiatric illnesses, those who suffer from major depressive disorder in particular uh, seem to have the lowest response rate to medication. In fact, about a third of people with major depressive disorder don't improve when uh, taking antidepressant medications. Uh, if our work at Imro is successful, hopefully within a few years, we'll have some better treatments available. But in the meantime, what can people who have treatment-resistant depression do to improve their mental health? Um, so with us today is uh, Gathri Ramprasad. Uh, she's the author of Shadows in the Sun, Healing from Depression and Finding the Light Within. And she's also founder of Asha International, a nonprofit organization. And um, Gathri has been, as she shared in her memoir, she's been through the abyss of treatment-resistant depression and anxiety, and she's recovered using uh, a range of approaches that kind of are holistic and you might call a whole lifestyle approach. So, um, Gathri, it's so great to have you with us on Brainwaves today. Th thanks for Skyping in. Oh, thank you so much, Brandon. You know, first and foremost, I want to thank you for taking the time to read my memoir and get more, in, you know, insight into my journey. Thank you for that. But I also wanted to take a moment to sincerely applaud your work and your family's work through IMRO. It's groundbreaking research that you're invested in and very critical work. Um, in unveiling, understanding and unveiling the causes and cures of mental illness. So thank you. Thanks to you, your family, and all the researchers and, uh, you know, the, the entire team that's invested in this very worthy endeavor. So thank you all. You're so welcome, Gathri. I mean, it's a, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you so much. It means a lot to us to do the work. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. More power to you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, great. So, uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, your your journey with depression to start out, okay? Definitely. Okay, and uh, I know that from having read your memoir that your experience with treatment resistant depression has been harrowing and uh, nearly ended your life more than once. And uh, um, I think I might know from having read your story what your turning point might have been, that your lowest point, your turning point. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, um, what events led you to this this point, and and um, how did things start to change for you? Can you share that with our viewers, please? Absolutely. You know, as you know from reading the memoir, my darkest hour was being confined in the seclusion room of a psychiatric ward here in Portland, Oregon, and here in America. As traumatic as that was. I was 27 years old at that point in time. I was a mother of a three-year-old little girl. I was pregnant with my second child. And we were, my husband and my, me and our three-year-old little girl were living like prisoners in our own home. Not even our best friends knew what it is that we were struggling with. And day in and day out, you know, I was obsessed about killing myself, not because I didn't want to live, but because I believed it was the only way out of my despair. I believed that my family would be better off without a despicable woman like me. I believed that my daughter's life would be better off without a crazy mother like me. Um, so it was absolute helplessness and lack of social support and the secrecy and the pain that comes along with all of that that led me ultimately as a last resort to seek help to start understanding about my illness, to learn how to cope with it. And unfortunately, you know, as hospital protocols were back then, I was confined in the seclusion room twice within 10 days, and I lost the pregnancy in between. Yes, I was very actively suicidal, and that was the protocol back then. But see, during that second time in the isolation cell, I had an awakening of sorts. You know, I, in a very startling moment of clarity, I knew I had a choice. I could either die cursing the darkness or I could light a candle and emerge from this crucible of pain and of trauma. I could emerge a messenger of hope and healing. And so that day, as the darkness of my womb and the world around threatened to engulf me, I promised to emerge a candle in the dark. I promised that for every indignity that I had suffered in shame and silence, 
I would fight to restore the dignity of not just myself, but others like me around the world. And for every day my family and I had lived in despair, I promised I would bring hope to the lives of others like us. You speak with so, as someone with an amazing resilience of your own and um, who's been through, you know, such horrible pain and suffering and and then come out of it, you know, pledged to yourself to to help other people, as you said. And that, that's just an amazing thing to tell uh, for for, to, for us to share with our, our viewers today. So thank you for, for explaining all that. And and now um, you, you I know I understand that you manage your your mental health, your wellness, because um, you, you, you have had a, a terrible time with mental illness. So you need to manage it and you do that with um, some approaches that you blogged about, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, meditation and exercise. And can you please share with our viewers so they can understand uh, how these techniques are, are helping you to, to enhance your well-being and, and empower you as a person? Absolutely. You know, like millions of people around the world, Brandon, I'm sure you uh, were in the same shoes that I had been in. Like millions of people, we all sit around going, oh my God, I pray there is a pill that will promise us nirvana. They'll just cure all our ills and make us all healthy and happy. Well, I was no different, you know. For many, many years, I prayed and I searched and I tried and I tried very many different medications. Unfortunately, they weren't working for me. And, it, you know, it's, it was more than a decade of trial and error that I finally came to a point in my life to realize perhaps there's another way. Perhaps there are many other ways to help me heal, right? And ironically, it was an American physician, a resident during one of my hospitalizations that asked me one day, you know, that really, first of all, he said, you know, Gayatri, I, I, I see you working so hard on your recovery. And I, I'm so sorry that the medications aren't working well for you. But have you tried other avenues? Have you tried pranayama? Have you tried meditation? Have you tried yoga? And I remember looking, me, the Indian woman that was born and raised in India in a culture that all of these wonderful life-affirming practices had been, you know, had originated, looking at this American man going, what? <laughs> <laughs> because it was ironic that I had to travel halfway around the world, nearly lose my, you know, sanity in my life many times over to be introduced to these life-affirming practices by an American here in America. But the beauty is, the beauty is the universal healing power of these practices. It doesn't matter if you're Indian or American or you're from Nepal or you're from Thailand or from Australia, right? Much like mental illnesses are a universal affliction, so is the healing power of these universal practices, right? It's phenomenally powerful. Now, was I born and raised in a culture that originated these skills? Yes. Did I grow up watching my own family or my friends practicing these skills? Absolutely not. But I'm so glad that I listened. You know, like there's a Buddhist proverb that says, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Believe me, in, in that psych ward, I was ready. <laughs> I was at last a student of my own pain and my own life, and I was willing to learn anything this teacher was here to teach me. So I started learning how to practice transcendental meditation and pranayama and yoga, and my life has been absolutely transformed by it. Again, you know, there are lots of myths and misperceptions about how difficult meditation is or how insane it is to try to sit still and, foc and be mindful and just focus on a mantra and your breath when, you know, most, most of our minds are like monkey, you know, brains going here, there, all over, and I'm no different. But as with any practice, with consistent practice, this is a you know skill that has completely transformed my life and transcendental meditation is one of the many forms of meditation and you know dr Herbert benson at the mind body institute has done a lot of research he's a physician from Harvard that has done a lot of research on meditative techniques from around the world and tm is one of those techniques that he studied and one of the questions that i get asked when i'm presenting around the world is well tm is very exclusive and it's expensive to get trained in transcendental meditation. So what do you suggest 
people do that cannot afford or access this training? And it's a very important question. Fortunately, there are so many other forms of meditation, including Dr. Herbert Benson's you know, technique, which he calls the relaxation response. Anybody with access to a library or uh, the internet can download these very simple steps that they can practice anywhere, anytime, at no cost at all, and all the benefits to gain from it. So definitely meditation has been uh, the sacred place. Like I say, you know, one of my favorite uh, quotes uh, that I wrote a while back about the power of meditation is, it's only in the silence of our mind that we can hear the song of our soul. And that's what meditation is for me. It creates this quiet place for myself where I can disconnect from the chaos of the outside world and stop reacting to my environment, but go inward to this place of peace and serenity where there's nothing but a quiet calm and clarity and creativity. And I can hear the song of my own soul in that place of silence and sacredness. And that is in of itself a huge, huge life force that has helped me thrive. Awesome. Wow. Uh, that's incredible. And well, no, it's credible because <laughs> uh, I've experienced some of that myself. I do some meditation and some yoga, uh, not as much as you do evidently, but um, I've actually used, uh, there are certain um, apps available for um, say the iPhone that uh, one of them is called, the one that I use is called Headspace. And uh, I've used it uh, for a total of about um, 20, 25 sessions. And uh, it's helped me to, um, to learn to meditate uh, in the, the way that it does. And uh, um, I, I've experienced a lot of that inner clarity and um, uh, ability to stay balanced in whatever's going on. Even after, even while I'm not meditating, you know, it, so it does have an effect for me too. So yeah, so uh, so you know, it's interesting that there's a growing harmony between um, practices for uh, for therapy and for treatments for mental illness that have arisen from uh, scientific research and th the more holistic approaches like you're talking about. Uh, for example, meditation has been shown in a recent scientific study uh, to be an effective treatment uh, for mild depression and anxiety, w which you know from your own personal experience, but science is now showing that in general. Um, so uh, my question for you is what would you most like to see neuropsychiatric research focus on over the next five years? Yeah, first of all, I want to, you know, just address the research that's already going on on these holistic, um, you know, practices. I I'm really thrilled to see even the VA um, embrace mindfulness and meditation in not just helping our veterans uh, manage their PTSD, which is a huge issue, as you know, also pain management, right? Uh, we're at a point in time that they are investing in researching and integrating these practices to alleviate the suffering, but to more importantly, to enhance well-being in the lives of our veterans. And I'm so happy to see that. And there are lots of other projects where they're introducing meditation and mindfulness you know, practices into schools and prisons and all uh, you know aspects of our society, which I'm really, really thrilled. And you know, I always smile when people ask me about research, as much regard as I have for research, which I do. I always feel like science takes a while to catch up with what my soul has always known. <laughs> you know, but then again, I'm happy. I'm happy that science, you know, is backing up with research. So, what would I, you know, dream of seeing in in the decades to come? First of all, science is incredibly important in dispelling the myths and misperceptions about mental illness, right? So it's a huge, huge tool. And the more we understand about the brain and the body and how mental illnesses impact our whole being, and the more we can share that with the general public, the better we can combat stigma, the better we can advocate for better policies to help make mental health affordable and accessible for all, 
And the more we can invest in health promotion, mental health promotion, as opposed to just prevention or intervention, right? So research has a huge role in all these areas where the more we can unveil the mysteries of the brain and how it interacts with the body and the environment, the better we are as a human race to be able to dispel these myths and misperceptions and understand the complexity of the mind and the body and how it's integrated with the, the environment as well and come up with better health promotional practices, right? Um, anything else? You know, of course, you know, I'm always curious about the holistic practices, research on the holistic practices, not just on meditation. How about exercise? How about nutrition? How about sleep? You know, you and I know when we are getting sick, our inability to fall asleep and stay asleep is one of the biggest hallmarks, right? It's, it's a symptom, it's a trigger, it's all of that. Well, there is a huge connection between sleep and psychiatric illnesses. Yeah. So I would like to see more research done in that area to see, well, if we can help a person regain their ability to get a good amount of restful, restorative, replenishing sleep, will that then affect their overall wellness and their need for medications or whatever, right? I mean, it, it's, it's a world of possibilities that is waiting to be explored. Um, so yeah, and how about social connectedness? You know, we know beyond, we all know that in our hearts, no matter what the pain we are suffering, there are people in our lives that just merely being in their presence is healing to us. And yet, you know, as a woman that came from a culture that's a very collectivistic culture in India and a woman that has lived here for longer in her life uh, in America, wonderful, wonderful country, but it's an individualistic culture. There are benefits to both cultures and those values, but social isolation is one of the biggest problems here in America. And for those of us that are struggling with a psychiatric illness, it's not only a symptom but it is much more than that to contend with. Social isolation becomes this vicious cycle that feeds on itself and keeps us from getting well. And unless we can break through our own psychosis or depression or suicidal ideation or anxiety and somehow reestablish those human connections and feel connected, deeply connected, it's hard for us to belong, to be well again. So I'd like to see research on aspects of social connectedness. Excellent. Great. So, Gathri, um, uh, if anyone has any questions for you on Brainwaves after I post this video, are you willing to answer some questions? It would be my honor, Brandon. Okay. Great. Yes. Thank you so much for being on Brainwaves today, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.